Before we start looking at Jonah, I want to ask you something called the would you rather test. Would you rather listen to a very annoying laugh for a whole day or be tickled for one hour? Would you rather have the ability to speak with animals and pets or to know what other people are thinking? And the third one, would you rather have a very odd shaped nose or two very odd shaped ears? And on a more serious note, would you rather take a doctrine and belief test or would you rather undergo a behavior and a lifestyle test? as a Christian? Possibly neither, <laughs> but I think most of us would probably choose the beliefs test. If I asked, tested you on what does a Christian believe? But if we came around and analyzed and looked at your life and how you behaved, most people would prefer probably not, thank you. We're all a work in progress by God's grace. Here's another um, little quiz before we get going. A yes, no test. A yes, no test. Right. Question number one. Should you share your faith? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> we all tick yes, of course, as a Christian. And question number two. Should you let your light shine before others? Yes. Okay. <laughs> of course. Now, we know the beliefs. Um, for example, in the Bible, it says, Jesus said, let your light shine before men. Don't hide your lamp under a bowl. Uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Jesus also said in Matthew 28, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. We know that. Yes, amen. I know that doctrine. I know that belief. Philippians says, shine as stars in the night in this crooked generation, holding out the word of God, the word of life. We know that. 1 Peter chapter 2 says these words, declare, we declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. So we know what the Bible says, and I do. But do we believe with our lifestyle in sharing the good news of Jesus with other people? Jonah knows his doctrine, but we're going to see there's a big gap between who he says he fears who he says he believes in, and how he then behaves. So Jonah did really well on beliefs and doctrine, but he didn't do so well on behavior and lifestyle because God said go to Nineveh, and he went in exactly the opposite direction to a place called Tarshish. The God of mission would love him to go, but he doesn't want to do it. He is known by some authors as the reluctant evangelist. Can I recommend two books to you? Uh, one's called The Reluctant Evangelist by Richard Coakin. Very good book, a uh, nice book to read, very readable. And it's a Timothy Keller book called The Prodigal Prophet. Purchase them. They're, they're really good books. But before we look at Jonah's behavior, though, I want to just give a bit of background quickly to the book of Jonah. Because you might be sitting there, if you know the book of Jonah, you might think, well, is it really true? Is it fact or fiction? I mean, we know it's a Sunday school story. You know, we, we all know Jonah, the story of Jonah and the whale or the big fish. And, but, you know, is it real? I mean, there are nine miracles I could count in this book. One, a sudden massive storm on the sea suddenly appearing. Two, they do a dice game on the ship to try and work out, or a casting of lots, to work out who, who's guilty for this storm. And it happens to land on Jonah's name. So God is there controlling a dice or something. Three, Jonah gets swallowed alive by a giant fish. I mean, you know, who believes this stuff? Is, is that possible? Although some scholars think he actually died inside the whale or fish and rose again. But I think he survived. Um, then you've got a fish puking up. <laughs> Or vomiting a man onto a beach. That's, that's another slightly crazy miracle. You've got a whole city repenting. A whole city turning to God. You've got a plant that grows up quickly and dies overnight. You've got a worm that does what God tells it to do. And then at the end of the book, you've got a hot, scorching wind that suddenly comes from nowhere and beats down on Jonah's bald head. <laughs> 
Uh, there are nine miracles. Now, is that real? So some scholars have got, kind of said, well, it must be made up. It must be a, just a, kind of a parable. And some scholars have come up with these ideas. They think that maybe it's just a story to remind Israel that they should be missionaries to other nations. You know, they mustn't run away uh, from their missionary responsibility, like Jonah. Other scholars have said it's an allegory. Um, and Jonah is a personification of Israel. You know, like in America, they say Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam is a picture of America, isn't he? He's not a real bloke. He's, a, but he's Uncle Sam, you know, the posters. And for Britain, I didn't know this, but we've got this rather plump fellow called um, John Bull. Have you ever heard of John Bull? He's meant to be a personification of Britain. Um, some of you might have heard of Britannia. Royal Britannia, you know, that, that's a personification. Well, some scholars think, well, Joan is just a made up kind of fictional allegory. And um, when he gets swallowed by the whale, it's really, all it's really talking about is when Israel got swallowed up by exile, got swallowed up by Assyria, or swallowed up by Babylon. You know, it's a kind of a pictorial. Now, I don't believe that. I think Jonah was a real man. Why? Because Jesus thought that. Jesus referred to Jonah as a real person. And also we read in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 14, we read about a prophet called Jonah who served under King Jeroboam II when Israel was expanding its borders. Um, so I think Jonah was definitely a real man with a real beard and a real pair of sandals. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> back to his behaviour. In verses 1 to 2, you get what's called, I think, the call to mission. And it says there, uh, I'll just read it out. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. The NIV just says, go to Nineveh. But other Bibles have the word arise or get up and go. And uh, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I think that's quite important. But what, what was Nineveh? Well, Nineveh was the capital of the big foreign power, Assyria, at the time. And they were really cruel. They were one of the cruelest, most brutal nations in all of history. Um, Think like, a bit like Nazi Germany. Kind of, you know, they were really cruel. They used to, I don't want to go into any gory details, but just one example. They, they invented the practice of sticking people alive onto wooden stakes and skewering them alive and waiting for them to die. So they were nice, friendly people, weren't they? You wouldn't want them invading your country. They ruled by terror. And Jonah might have been a bit scared to go there, possibly. It's a bit like sending a Jew to Berlin in World War II to preach in Nazi Germany and, you know, <laughs> it, it's probably, naturally speaking, uh, it's a bit like sending a Ukrainian to, to, to Russia today to preach. It's that kind of uh, place. But I think the big reason Jonah said, I'm not doing it, is because he thought, well, God, they don't deserve mercy. They don't deserve the good news. It won't work. Evangelism won't work with them. Um, God's a God of justice. They're, they're wicked. They don't deserve mercy. How can God show mercy to them? You know, Jonah had a problem with the God of justice showing mercy. But we know that through Christ, God, who is holy and just, can show mercy because of Jesus. Also, maybe Jonah knew about a man called Nahum. Now, Nahum was another prophet. And a lot of scholars think he was earlier than Jonah. And do you know what Nahum said? Nahum said, Nineveh is going to be wiped out. God's going to destroy Nineveh. So Jonah thought, well, there's no point going there then, is there? God, I know better than you. They're not going to respond. Um, God, I don't trust you. You know, Nahum said they're going to be destroyed. He thought he knew better than God. And isn't that sometimes how we behave? You know, you, you might want to share your faith or you think, well, that person isn't going to respond. They're a complete lost cause. And you, you think you know better than God. Um, so Jonah 
He runs away. Now, where does he go? A place called Tarshish. Now, Tarshish, we don't know where it was, but some people think it was in Spain. It was probably about 2,500 miles away. <laughs> uh, whereas Nineveh was only 500 across the land. But Tarshish was probably a bit like us going to New Zealand. It was the far end of the world for, for a Jew. It was like the, the rim of the world. I, I, you know, where do you want to go? <laughs> Tarshish. And if you notice in that passage there, the author is very clever. Because although this is a simple story, there's actually a lot of crafting in, gone into it. There's a lot of um, skill in how it's written. And the author repeats the word Tarshish three times. If you just look at it on the screen there, it says Jonah, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. You see, Tarshish, Tarshish, Tarshish. Why does the author repeat it? Because the author is simply saying Jonah was going absolutely against what God wanted. Um, he was going against God. Now, you might think, oh, well, I don't do that. I'm a nice Christian. <laughs> but sometimes we can behave a little bit like this. And I'm talking to myself before anyone here. You know, Christians should be cheerfully wanting to share their faith, but often we refuse or we think, well, it's not going to work. Um, I remember, um, can I just tell a quick story from my old church? We once put on a week of mission fun days and mission events. We had a whole week of them uh, done with churches together in 2014. And we had lots of opportunities for the gospel. Our church did one or two things and all the other churches all together did a week of mission um, across the city. And uh, there were countless opportunities to, for people to bring a friend to hear the gospel uh, and to hear the truth. And I always remember one man in our church, do you know what he did that week? He disappeared. <laughs> he hid the entire week. He ran away. And um, he was nowhere to be seen. He had friends, but he just... Anyway, a few weeks later, I caught up with him. I won't give you his name. I said, oh, we really missed you. Where, what, where did you go during the week of mission? And he said, well, he said, evangelism never works, does it? Doesn't work. He says, oh, I've tried it before. That's failed. And, and he said, I decided to hide until the challenge had gone. And he was behaving a bit like Jonah. <laughs> now, I'm not knocking anyone present. I'm just remembering a story uh, from a friend of mine. Don't think we can't behave like Jonah, because sometimes we can. Now, Jonah, did you know the name Jonah, just highlighted there, Jonah, it has lots of meanings, but the Hebrew is the word dove. A dove is a good word in many contexts, picture of the Holy Spirit. But in Hebrew, the word dove is also an idiom, idiom for silliness. There's a little verse in Hosea, I think, saying Ephraim is as silly as a dove. Did you know that verse? Um, I can't remember where it is, but it's in Hosea. But the point is this, some of the things Jonah did are rather silly and quite comical. I mean, you think about it. Um, he gets thrown overboard, he gets swallowed by a fish, spewed onto a beach, then ends up sulking under a bush. It's quite comical, almost farcical. Um, but uh, anyway, that's blessed Jonah. Now, if you notice in the rest of this, uh, said to him arise get up go get up and go but he does the rank opposite because um if you look uh, in verse three i think it's three times two times sorry the phrase he went down so the word of the lord said to jonah arise or get up go to nineveh the great city call out against it but then it says he went down to joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. That's in the ESV version, which I think is slightly more accurate. I love the NIV, but I think in this case, 
the actual wording is more, he went down, he went down. And if you get to, um, I think it's verse 5, it says at the bottom of the screen there, when the storm is going on, Jonah, again, had gone down into the inner part of the ship, the hold. So God's telling him to go up, and he's going down, going down, going down. Why does the author put that there? Simply to point out, I think, that um, Jonah did not want to go on mission. <laughs> he wanted to do the opposite. He didn't want to do what God wanted. Now, if you know the story, Jonah keeps going down, doesn't he? Next picture. Blah, 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 blah. Next, he gets thrown into the sea and he goes down. Blah, 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 blah. Then he gets swallowed by a fish, a giant fish or a whale. And the whale goes down. And if you read the book, it talks about Jonah going down into the depths of the sea, down to the roots of the mountains or the very base of the mountains. It says seaweed was wrapped around his head. He went down to the depths of the earth at the bottom of the sea. God said, go up. Jonah kept going down. Now, it's a picture of someone basically running away from what God wants. But Jonah is also a picture of Christ in a way because you know what happened to Christ? Christ was thrown into a storm for us. Jonah was thrown into a storm. Christ was thrown into a storm of God's wrath on the cross for us. And when Jonah was thrown in, the sailors were all saved. And when Christ was thrown into the storm, we were saved. And Jonah went down, 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 down. Christ went down. Christ went down into death. Christ went down into the grave. And Christ rose again. So it is a picture of uh, Jesus as well. Uh, you know when the, the sailors about to throw him overboard, they say, oh, Lord, you've done what has pleased you. You've done what has pleased you, Lord, and they throw Jonah in. Well, in Isaiah 53, it says that God was pleased to bruise his son, to crucify his son for us. So there's a lot in Jonah that doesn't first meet the eye. It's a deep picture of Jesus. But it's also, at a simpler level, a picture of someone who, whose behaviour didn't match up to what he believed. But the main point for now is that this chapter is about Jonah running away. So, what happened in the storm? From verses 4 to 16, you've got this a very uh, terrible storm happening. And... Uh, then the author, again, it's very well written. You might think it's a simple children's story, but it's actually very well written. And in, uh, when they write these things, uh, in Hebrew, there are pairs of sentences. There are pairs of sentences that, that seem to match up throughout the passage. So let me give you an example from verses 4. Uh, if you notice, um, in verse 4, God hurls a wind onto the sea. The actual word originally when the storm comes, is hurl. God hurls a, a, a storm onto the sea, a bit like someone hurling a spear. But at the end of the story, the sailors hurl Jonah into the sea. You see, there's a pair that matches. I hope this interests you. <laughs> it's interesting, though, how they write. And then you get a bit later on, that pair is this. The sailors pray to false gods in verse 5. But then in verse 14, the sailors end up praying again, but this time to the true God. So there's another pair going on. As the story progresses, another pair of phrases appears. The sailors ask, whose fault is it for the storm? They play a game of dice or lots to find whose fault is it, they ask, in verse 7. And then a bit later in the passage, in verse 12, Jonah says the storm it's my fault. It's my fault this storm has come. So there are these pairs happening. And it goes on. There are some sailors who question Jonah in verse 8, and then later on in verses 10 and 11, they question him again. You see the pairs. Now, what Hebrews do when they write 
stories like this uh, or recount what happened, they pair things up to get to the central point they're trying to make. And the central point we're now going to see is right in the middle. And I think it's verses 9 to 10. The central point is found in verse 9 and 10, which we're going to look at. Um, where everything is pointing. You see, in verse 9, Jonah is declaring his beliefs. He's got the right beliefs in his head. This is the centerpiece of the story. Verse 9, he, Jonah says, I am a Hebrew, I worship the Lord, or I fear the Lord. That's what it means. I fear the Lord. This is my belief. Fear means I respect God, I reverence him, I obey him. That's kind of what it means. I obey the Lord, I fear him. Then he says, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. I believe in this God. I'm a Hebrew. Bang. Okay. But the point of the author is making is, but it's not true. You fear the Lord, Jonah? No, you don't. You're running away. You say you believe this stuff, but your behavior is not matching your beliefs. That's the point. Um, Jonah is being a hypocrite in verse 9. And the sailors can see right through him. You know, he says, I fear the Lord. You can almost hear the sailors saying, no, you don't, Jonah. We're bewildered. There's a gap between what you say you believe and how you're behaving. Your behavior doesn't match your beliefs. And in verse 10, the sailors who are terrified, they say this. What have you done? <laughs> now, that is not a question for information. That is a question. Is, it's more like this. Are you a complete idiot? Sorry, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> are, you are you mad? That's what it, what have you done means. So what's happening here is the pagans are seeing through Jonah. He says he believes in this God who made the sea and the land, but he's running away. And isn't it embarrassing, I'm talking to us now, when a non-Christian sees us behave in a certain way and says, you call yourself a Christian? You say you believe that? Well, look how you're behaving. You can imagine the pagans, on these pagan sailors, looking at his, what he said he believes, yet his behavior doesn't match up. Um, there's a gap. And they say, look, here's some examples. Okay, you talk about the God of heaven, who's everywhere. But you're going to Tarshish to run away from the presence of the God of heaven. You can't run away from the God of heaven. He's everywhere. You can run away from Nineveh, Jonah, but you can't run away from God. Are you an idiot? What have you done? Or, or you can imagine them thinking, you just told us, God made the sea. You made the sea. Well, hang on a minute. You, you made this, and you're escaping on a boat from the one who made the sea. Jonah, are you mad? Um, Jonah's hypocrisy. I, I, I read this article. I heard this in a talk somewhere. But I'll read it out. The Times columnist, columnist, Times editor columnist called Matthew Paris, who's an atheist. He said these words. He said, if I believed what Christians say they believe about the gospel, I would leave my job. I would set out after selling my house with a burning desire to know more and more. And when I had found out enough, I would go telling others about it. I cannot understand how Christians can spend their waking hours in any other endeavor. <laughs> Now, the sailors would have seen Jonah saying all these beliefs and seeing his behavior as different. And um, <clears throat> they would have noticed that he wasn't praying. They were praying to their gods, but he wasn't praying. He was asleep. And then when he's found out, what does Jonah do? Does he say, I repent? I'm sorry, God. I'll go to Nineveh. No. Do you know what he says? He says, I'd rather die. Kill me. <laughs> And this is something that Jonah often does. He often, rather than doing what God tells him, he says, oh, I'd rather just die. What's the point? Now, there's a lot of irony in this story. Um, 
That was just what I've been reading to you. Okay. But the irony is this. Jonah doesn't want to go in, on mission. He doesn't want to talk to unbelievers about the gospel or God in that way. Um, but yet here he is being forced into it on the deck of a ship in a storm. He's being forced to explain to the pagan sailors things about God. It's like God's having a bit of a joke with him. You know, he's forced to tell these sailors, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Now for Jonah, the whole point of being on the boat is to get away from doing what God wants. But God's, in God's thinking, oh, I'm going to outwit you, Jonah. I'm going to put you on a boatload of pagans where you have to tell them about me. See, God outwitted him. And uh, then they, get, they throw him into the sea. There's a picture of him being thrown into the sea. And he goes underwater and he doesn't know anything else what's happened. But back on deck, the sailors are converted as far as they could be in those days. Back on deck. Jo Jonah, the anti-missionary, by God's grace, has ended up converting a bunch of sailors. Because when he's under the sea, he doesn't know what happened. They're up on deck saying, oh, Lord, we vow vows to you. We sacrifice. They became And we mess up and muck up and get it wrong. God can still uh, save people through our, uh, you know, through us, his sovereignty. Now, very quickly, I want to look at the sailors a minute. Okay. And I want to ask you this question. We haven't got much longer. What is the big difference between Jonah and the sailors? Well, I think the difference is simply this. They both know the same thing. You see, they both know that they both now know God made the sea and the land. God's the God of heaven. But the big difference is that, that sailors actually really take it to heart. They absolutely take it to heart. Um, they actually fear God, whereas Jonah doesn't. Now, the fear felt by the sailors increases and changes over time. So in verse 5, at the beginning, they're scared. The sailors are scared, but it's, they're, they're only scared of the storm. Okay? They're scared of dying. You know, the ship's breaking up, the mast is creaking, the, the sails are coming off, and they're scared of dying. That's all they're scared of, natural death and the storm. But when it comes to Jonah telling them about this God of heaven, they start to get much more scared. It's like their fearometer. It's like a fearometer. It kind of goes up a scale, and it's a bit different this time. They're not just fearing death. They actually fear, well, there's a God now. We know of this God who's angry and upset because there's someone on this boat who isn't doing God's will. And they throw him in. And then afterwards, once he's been thrown in, if you look at the scriptures, it says... That they, at verse 16, at the very end of the reading, the men greatly feared the Lord. What I'm trying to say is their fear changed. They became people who feared God. Absolutely. It reminds me of a story in the Gospels. When Jesus calmed a storm, and once the storm was calm, the disciples in the boat feared exceedingly. It says they were terrified and they said, who is this? Of heaven and earth. And it's very interesting that they fear God when it's all calm, not during the storm. They, they, they come to fear God. So what am I trying to say today in all my spiel this is where i'm trying to get to this is all i want you to remember okay <laughs> this is the take home point point of this story is this which of these two characters are you going to be like are you going to be like jonah who i think is an anti-hero in this story he's not the hero jonah is someone who um has the right beliefs 
He believes in the God of heaven, the land, and who made the sea and the land. He has the right doctrine. He passed all the beliefs tests. He can tick all the right boxes, but he has failed the behavior test because he doesn't want to be on mission. He doesn't want to share his faith. He doesn't want to obey that calling. He would rather sleep and not pray. So do you want to be like Jonah? I presume the answer is no. Or do you want to be like the sailors? The heroic sailors? Because you see, although the sailors weren't going off to Nineveh, what was different was they took it seriously. They wholly offered up their lives to God. There was no gap between what they said and how they behaved. They vowed vows. They, they, were, they took God absolutely seriously. Okay, we may pass the beliefs test. Do we pass the behavior test? My last question is this. Do we pass the behavior test on the matter of our call to mission? God has called all of us to mission. Now, we are not called to go to Nineveh. We're not got the call of Jonah. But every Christian has been called to let their lamp shine. Jesus said, let your light shine. Don't put your light under a bowl. Let your light shine. Every Christian has been told to go and make disciples and share their faith. Every Christian has been asked and told to declare the praises of the God who called them out of darkness. Is that what we are like, or are we kidding ourselves? The God, he's a God of love, he's a God of forgiveness, but he's a God of mission. He does care about the nations and those around. Be like the sailors in chapter one, not like Jonah. Amen.